History as it happens, November 24th, 2022. Reagan's vision. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arm. The maxim voice. is dovayai no provayai. Trust but verify. Yet optimism is in order because day by day, democracy is proving itself to be a not at all fragile flower. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. A charge has been made that the United States has shipped weapons to Iran as ransom payment for the release of American hostages in Lebanon. Those charges are utterly false. There was neither shock nor surprise when the Soviet people learned of Chernyenko's death. They knew he was gravely ill. And the but inside this villa on the outskirts of Geneva, the Villa Fleur d'Eau, Mr. Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev sit down to talk. Mr. Gorbachev, mir nanas smatrit. The world is watching. And we've got something to show them. On the Soviet side, over 1,500 deployed warheads will be removed. And all ground-launched intermediate-range missiles, including the SS-20s, will be destroyed. You still think you're in an evil empire, Mr. President? No. More than 30 years after the end of the Cold War, hot war rages in Eastern Europe. The past generation's hope for stable, enduring peace shattered by Russian aggression. And the once warm relations between Washington and Moscow continue receding into the past. But it's still a recent past when Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev brought an end to the Cold War. William N. Bowden says it was Reagan's peace through strength that ushered in a new era, a form of statecraft he says the U.S. must stick to and Republicans must reclaim today. That's next as we report History as it Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Reagan also saw, I think earlier than most, that the Soviet economy was very fragile, decrepit. Ordinary Russian and other Soviet citizens were losing faith in the system. And so there's economic and political and ideological weakness within the system. Tear down this wall. Welcome to the Palace of Westminster, the president of my mother's country, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President Reagan. June 8, 1982. My Lord Chancellor, Mr. Speaker, the journey of which this visit forms a part... 14 months after surviving an assassination attempt, and with the U.S. economy in a deep recession and unemployment soaring, with the Cold War in a deep freeze, Ronald Reagan delivered one of the most important speeches of his presidency to the British Parliament. And there, once again, our sister democracies have proved that even in a time of severe economic strain, free peoples can work together freely and voluntarily to address problems as serious as... In his new comprehensive account of Reagan's foreign policy, The Peacemaker, Ronald Reagan, The Cold War and the World on the Brink, historian William N. Bowden writes, though Reagan knew he needed to hearten Americans, reassure Europeans, and scare the Soviets, he also resolved to give a speech that transcended the precarious political moment. Reagan would describe his ambition to bring the Soviet Union to a negotiated surrender and the world he envisioned in its wake. Optimism comes less easily today, not because democracy is less vigorous, but because democracy's enemies have refined their instruments of repression. Yet optimism is in order, because day by day, democracy is proving itself to be a not at all fragile flower. In Bowdoin is the executive director of the Clement Center for National Security at the University of Texas at Austin. He was senior director for strategic planning on the National Security Council during the George W. Bush administration. And he argues Reagan's combination of strategic pressure and diplomatic outreach, peace through strength, ended the Cold War and brought down the USSR, which Reagan knew was actually much weaker than some analysts believed. In an ironic sense, Karl Marx was right. We are witnessing today a great revolutionary crisis, a crisis where the demands of the economic order are conflicting directly with those of the political order. But the crisis is happening not in the free, non-Marxist West, but in the home of Marxist-Leninism, the Soviet Union. This book lands at a time when autocracy is said to be on the march worldwide. 
when Reagan's old party is split between what's left of the internationalists or interventionists and the Trumpian populists who disdain alliances and multilateralism, who question the Biden administration's unwavering and expensive support for Ukraine. The book's an argument that Reagan was right to confront communism everywhere possible, even if, as Inboden concedes, his administration made some terrible mistakes along the way, like supporting the Contras in Nicaragua. But let me put this in capital letters. I did not know about the diversion of funds. Indeed, I didn't know there were excess funds. Yet the buck does not stop with Admiral Poindexter, as he stated in his testimony. It stops with me. Our guest today is not as critical of Reagan's record as, say, historian John Dower. In his book, The Violent American Century, Dower cites the work of John Coatsworth, who observed that the Contra insurrection in Nicaragua devastated the economy, forced the government to abandon most of its social programs, and cost the lives of 30,000 Nicaraguans, mostly civilian supporters of the Sandinista Revolution. He put the death toll in El Salvador between 1979 and 84 at nearly 40,000, most of whom were unarmed combatants murdered by the armed forces. Dower goes on to write that Coatsworth also noted in passing that President Reagan visited Guatemala City in December 1982 and praised the ruling military junta for its commitment to defend the country against the threat of communism. But in 1982-83 alone, that government forced 800,000 peasants into civil patrols ordered to uncover and kill insurgents or see their communities destroyed. It followed up on its threat by destroying an estimated 686 villages and hamlets and killing between 50,000 and 75,000 people. So I'm bringing up Dower here just to illustrate how controversial Reagan's record remains. But it is a record worth examining, without the mythology, of course, that sprouted up around Reagan's legacy as he faded from the scene. And as we assess and reassess the end of the Cold War more than 30 years later, what did Reagan get right? To what extent did his successors and Gorbachev's successors stray from a vision of a peaceful world without nuclear weapons, where a post-Soviet Europe, including Russia, would embrace democracy and capitalism? Or maybe rather than viewing the end of the Cold War as an event that gave birth to a new world, the collapse of the USSR triggered a process still playing out today in the so-called wars of Soviet succession. Looking at it that way, can Reagan's statecraft offer us a guide to solving today's dilemmas, or does it belong in a bygone era? William N. Bowden, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Martin. Great to be with you. One of my favorite subjects lately, the end of the Cold War, the post-Cold War world. Enough time has indeed passed to allow historians such as yourself to evaluate and reevaluate the significance of the end of the Cold War, all those expectations for humanity, especially with what's going on now in Eastern Europe. I think it makes it imperative that we look at this chapter of history again, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I took up the book just as a pure historical project of wanting to you know, look back at Reagan's foreign policy during the 1980s. And I think enough time has passed, you know, it's over 30 years since the end of the Reagan administration, over 40 years since he took office, that we can judge it with some critical distance now, knowing how the story ended, uh, evaluating policy outcomes. But also as a scholar, it's a great time because in just in the last few years, so many archival documents have been freshly declassified. So I was just as a matter of time, one of the first scholars able to look at a lot of newly declassified documents of transcripts of Reagan National Security Council meetings, transcripts of his meetings with with heads of state, you know, declassified CIA assessments. And also, yet it's recent enough that quite a few people who served in the Reagan administration were still alive and I was able to interview them. A sad commentary on the passing of time is seven of the people I interviewed in the last few years have died recently. So I was able to get to you know, George Schultz, Frank Carlucci, Bud McFarlane, Colin Powell before they passed away. In addition to cataloging all those newly declassified documents, you wrote a narrative here. And you even say in your introduction, the reader might feel a little bit of whiplash, but that's how history has played out. There were a lot of crises going on in the early 1980s. Why did you choose to write a narrative that also does include a lot of this granular detail of what was going on behind the scenes? Yeah, it was very deliberate. And this is my first time trying to write a narrative so readers can judge uh, if they think I I made it work or not. But partly I wanted to make it more readable. Partly I wanted to recapture some of the drama of the Cold War. But there's an argument embedded in doing it as a narrative. 
to restore contingency, restore human agency to the story. There were certainly some favorable structural trends in the international system and within the Soviet system that were playing out in the late 70s, early 80s. But Reagan and his team, even though they had, I think, a pretty clear, deliberate strategy, they couldn't know for sure how the story was going to end. You know, every day they're arriving in the office at their desks, worried if this could be the last day on Earth, that we're all going to go go up in a nuclear apocalypse. And that terror, that uncertainty, I think is important for readers to appreciate in understanding how history unfolds and the weight of a number of the decisions they were making. And then the other part, as you mentioned, with you know the different policies I throw in, and here's where I draw on my own time as a former policymaker for about you know 15 years or so, is even if you know as a policymaker you're trying to focus on one big issue, you know counterterrorism as we did in the Bush administration or the Cold War grand strategy as Reagan and his team were doing, you've got 20 or 30 other issues that are crashing in on your inbox that have to be dealt with, political challenges, as smaller policy challenges. So Reagan and his team were dealing with you know terrorism, the Middle East, international trade tensions, especially with our, our Asian allies, challenges in Southern Africa with apartheid and the Cuban occupation of, of Angola. So, so many other policy challenges crashing in, and they're trying to navigate those. They get some of them right, they get some of them wrong, but you can't understand what they were doing with the Soviet account in the Cold War without also at least understanding all the other policy challenges in, in the milieu and, and taking up their inboxes. Well, I agree with your assertion that Ronald Reagan was the second most consequential. Now, consequential, influential doesn't necessarily mean positive or negative, but he was the second most consequential president of the 20th century after Franklin Roosevelt. And in my view, his most important legacy was his effort to de-escalate the Cold War with Gorbachev and Thatcher as well. We'll get to that. But how did he get there from Inauguration Day 1981? That's what you try to accomplish in your book here. Let's first remind people briefly the state of the world in 1980, 1981, domestically, foreign policy was not a good time for the United States. Yeah, and I do try to set the scene in the book with just recapturing what was, you know, the long crisis of the 1970s. I mean, so we'll start with domestically, uh, the American economy was a mess. We had what was called stagflation, this really pernicious combination of high unemployment and high inflation. And that, of course, is tacked on top of the recurring energy crisis. America was much more dependent on Middle Eastern oil uh, at the time. And with the uh, OPEC embargo through the 1970s, it had crippled our energy supplies. So the very long lines at the gas station. In terms of national morale and geopolitics, we were still dealing with the aftermath of the first lost war in our country's history in the Vietnam War and the demoralization that that brought. We're dealing with political scandal. You know, it's still just a few years after the Watergate scandal. By the time Reagan takes office, the previous five presidencies had all ended prematurely. You know, Kennedy had been assassinated. LBJ did not run again because of Vietnam. Nixon resigns from Watergate. Gerald Ford is defeated by Carter. Carter is defeated by Reagan. So there's also a sense that the presidency itself is broken. And meanwhile, communism, largely sponsored by the Soviet Union, is making advances around the world. I mean, just in the 1970s, uh, Afghanistan, South Vietnam, South Yemen, Laos, Cambodia, Angola, Ethiopia, Grenada, Nicaragua, they all fall to communist regimes. A lot of those are sponsored by the Soviet Union. Of course, other local factors are, are involved as well. Every one of those is a complex story. But the aggregate seems to be the Soviet Union is winning the Cold War and the United States is losing the Cold War. We're losing at home and we're losing abroad. And so that tangle of challenges is what Reagan inherited. And I didn't even mention, you know, the Iran hostage crisis, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, you know, those are things. So it's a very weak hand. Yeah, a very weak hand he inherits. And there was also a sense that detente had failed or it lived out its usefulness and that the Soviet Union had exploited it to make gains, right? And obviously yeah. the hard right, the conservative right in this country did not like detente. Yeah. And this is where Reagan's first real debut as a national player in Republican politics comes when he challenges Ford for the Republican nomination in 1976. And the interesting thing about that, he challenges President Ford almost entirely on foreign policy grounds so over detente, right? So Reagan is a pretty early critic of detente. And I, I try in the book to give a balanced assessment of detente. When Nixon and Kissinger first develop it as a way of lessening tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union, looking for ways for the United States and Soviet Union to cooperate on things, you know, stopping a runaway arms race, 
for a time, it does help its purposes. It plays a role in our opening to China, in our withdrawal from Vietnam, in a recalibration there. But the premises of detente, you know, for a lessening of tensions, the Soviets very soon see that as an opportunity for them to exploit that opening. And as Jimmy Carter's Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, had put it, talking about the arms race, when we build, they build, referring to the American and Soviet defense buildups. Then when we stop building in detente, they keep building. And Reagan noticed that the Soviets were treating detente not as a bargain with the U.S. to lessen tensions, but as an opportunity for them to increase their power and exploit what seemed to be uh, American weakness. So Reagan was very critical of that. And most of the Cold War, the U.S. had the decided advantage in military power, but then there was a rough parity come the 1980s. So one area where I've criticized Reagan, and uh, we'll get into his first term here, but just one more point is how he saw a Soviet hand in almost everything. He didn't see communism as a world monolith. He understood there was a difference between the Soviet Union and China and that they were at Mm -hmm. odds. But he often, as Archie Brown put it in one of his recent books, he frequently referred to a Soviet goal of creating a single communist state encompassing the entire world, although that was far from the agenda, writes Brown, of the aged oligarchy headed by Brezhnev. Uh, I do not believe at this juncture in history the Soviet Union was interested in exporting its model of communism all over the world, but it certainly was backing some of these indigenous leftist movements in places like Central America. How do you sort out that argument? Yeah, I you know first want to say I hold Archie Brown in tremendous regard as a scholar. I've benefited quite a bit from his work, I and mean, certainly as a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union, he's really one of the world's truly great ones. That said, I do differ pretty substantially from from him on a number of interpretations, and we can we can talk about those. And these are, of course, all respectful disagreements that scholars have. But first, two points: one. With the declassification of so many Soviet archives in in the 1990s and and going forward, and still, you know, some are still being declassified, even though Putin has tightened it up on information more recently, the overwhelming weight of evidence seems to be that the Soviet Union was sponsoring and supporting more of these communist revolutionary movements than was appreciated at the time. It doesn't mean their hand wasn't in all of them. doesn't mean there weren't nationalist forces and local forces in, in play as well. But going back to that litany I recited earlier of all the Asian, African, Middle Eastern, Latin American countries that had gone communist just in the 1970s, those were not only indigenous local revolutions. The Soviet hand was pretty active in, in quite a few of them. And Reagan and his team had seen these advances by communism. They saw the Soviet invasion of of Afghanistan itself in 1979. They saw the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua in 1979. And it certainly appeared very plausible to them that Soviet communism was advancing. They overstated it at times. They may have somewhat misread at least some of these some of these local mm-hmm. factors, but it was a valid concern to have that the Soviet Union was seeing these as legitimate ways of its own power projection. So I think Archie is perhaps uh, overstating the criticism a little bit there. I bring up Archie Brown because he's been on the podcast a number of times, so I want my listeners to appreciate his view and yours and to read both of your work. Reagan comes to office January of 1981, and at this juncture, there is disagreement pretty much everywhere in official circles, his administration, among opinion writers, just how strong is the Soviet Union? How strong is its economy? It's kind of impossible to tell because of the opacity involved in trying to judge, you know, Soviet economic growth. But Reagan believed the Soviet Union was actually weaker than it appeared. It was both strong and weak at the same time. What did he base that outlook on? Yeah, this is where it's really important to understand what Reagan's assessment was. And you you get it just right. He assessed the Soviet Union to be this dangerous combination of strong and weak. Strong in terms of the Soviets, we now know, I think it's safe to say, really hit the apex of their military might somewhere in the early 1980s. You know, scholars can differ on the exact measurements there, but the Soviet military arsenal, both nuclear and conventional forces, were at the apex of its might in in this time. And so that is the strong Soviet Union. But Reagan also saw, I think earlier than most, that the Soviet economy was very fragile, decrepit. Uh, Many of the 
ordinary Russian and other Soviet citizens were losing faith in the system. And so there's economic and political and ideological weakness within the system. And he also sees growing strains and pressures being put on it by the cost of maintaining its satellites. So, you know, solidarity in Poland is kicking into gear at this time with, you know, a, a pretty strong resistance movement against the Soviet hand in controlling Poland. And most conventional wisdom, whether it's among CIA economic analysts or, or Soviet scholars at the time, was that the Soviet economy was stronger and more robust and resilient it was. No one thought that it's a booming model of growth, but rather the general assessment was it's growing at somewhere between 1% and 3% a year, and it's been doing that for a while, yeah. and it can continue that indefinitely. The Soviet Union will be a permanent part of the geopolitical landscape. And so for Reagan to come along and think that there's more weaknesses and vulnerabilities there, that was that was very, very controversial. Because it had gone through a period of some relative stability and better living conditions and standard of living under Brezhnev, at least compared to the utterly chaotic and disastrous Stalin and then the Khrushchev years. I mean, things were a yeah. little bit better. Yeah, a lot of these assessments are somewhat relative. But at the same time, look, I mean, one one key indicator was the Soviets were not able to feed their own people, right? And so Carter had imposed the grain embargo, no selling of American grain to the Soviet Union right after the Afghanistan invasion. Reagan early on lifts that grain embargo, partly as a gesture of outreach to, to Brezhnev, but partly because he wants to make clear that his fight is with Soviet communism as a system, not with the Russian people. And of course, he wanted American farmers to have open markets. But for him, just that sense of, wow, this system depends on an exports of American grain, even though it has, you know, the largest agrarian reserves in the world, you know, with, you know, the Soviet Union span 11 time zones. There was something wrong with that system, he realized. The dimensions of this failure are astounding. A country which employs one fifth of its population in agriculture is unable to feed its own people. Political leaders can be technocrats, I guess, but political leaders really need to have a vision. And whenever I Think about the difference between a politician who talks like a technocrat and doesn't really connect with his audience, and then someone like Reagan who had a vision, knew where he wanted to take the country. I tell folks to watch the Reagan-Carter debate, especially the last two minutes. So Reagan does have this vision. He knows where he wants to take the world. He's asked about it. He basically says it means we win, they lose, meaning the United States wins the Cold War and the Soviet Union loses it. But he didn't really have a clear idea or a clear vision of what that would look like in the end. And he didn't have a plan on how to get there at first. And you see this in the first couple of years of his administration. There are conflicting views of this among his top advisors. And his first couple of years get off to a really chaotic start. Why don't you take us through that? Yeah, sure. These really important distinctions you draw there, Martin, where Reagan has his strategic priorities, restoring the American economy and winning the Cold War in peaceful terms. And he has his principles and his priorities, but he doesn't have the exact policies in place yet. And because he's a pretty dreadful manager, uh, and I make that very clear in the book, right? Uh, he just is inattentive to the right people to pick for the positions and how to manage them, especially when there are disagreements among your, your key staff and advisors. So, you know, his first year, year and a half in office, it's a chaotic disorganized administration, and very few of his team have a clear picture of what is our Soviet strategy. Reagan may have it in his mind, but he's not implementing it with, you know, National Security Council directives and clear speeches. But over that first year and a half, especially after, you know, the two key personnel moves he makes are dismissing Richard Allen and hiring Bill Clark as National Security Advisor, and then, of course, dismissing Al Haig and hiring George Shultz as Secretary of State, end of 81 and summer of 82. And then he starts to put in place uh, I think a more clear strategy towards the Soviet Union, which is, I can summarize as a combination of pressure and outreach. So I don't think that Reagan improvises as much as other scholars have said. I don't think that he reverses courses, as scholars have said. He'll make adaptations here and there, of course. But throughout, I think you see a pretty uh, consistent uh, two prongs of pressure, military, economic, diplomatic, ideological pressure, and we can talk through those components, and also outreach, writing letters to Soviet leaders, saying, I want to meet with you, saying, let's talk, let's find a way to reduce tensions between our countries, reduce the threat of nuclear war, and bring this to a peaceful resolution. And, and so that's what his strategy is. And I summarize it as a negotiated surrender. Yeah, I agree. His vision was consistent. He was also pragmatic, where he could make tactical revisions when necessary. But it was mm -hmm. a matter of identifying the mechanisms to affect those changes. You know, how do you exert internal pressure within a country like the Soviet Union so it can reform itself, right? I mean, that was a vexing problem right through his entire presidency until Gorbachev comes along. 
Yeah. Yeah. And this is where my account will differ from some other scholars who want to give Gorbachev more credit for the peaceful end of the Cold War. Again, Archie Brown is one, uh, Bill Taubman is another, and I, I hold them in very high regard. I've learned a lot from them. But let me be clear, Reagan and Gorbachev together are indispensable. No Gorbachev and you don't have a peaceful end of the Cold War, you know, full stop. And I hold him in very high regard. But the reason I give Reagan in that equation a little bit more credit is – from the beginning of his first term, he's very clear, as are his some of his key advisors, such as Dick Pipes, that we want to pressure the Soviet system to produce a reformist leader, uh, that we want to pressure the Soviet system to strengthen the reformist impulses within it, and then we will have a negotiating partner. I'm not saying that Reagan gets full credit for Gorbachev actually coming to power, because that's more product of internal Soviet dynamics and the Politburo there. But the key thing is Reagan spends his first four years looking for a Soviet reformer. So when Gorbachev comes along, that's why you know from the book I titled that chapter, Waiting for Gorbachev, Reagan embraces him pretty quickly because he's been looking for someone like this. He thinks, ah, maybe this is the reformer I've been I've been looking for. This can be the negotiating partner I've I've been looking for. And so that's why I give Reagan a little bit more credit there for at least pushing for such a reformer to emerge and then embracing him when he when he does emerge. Let's get to 1985 in a little bit. I want to return yeah. to those points here. 1982. Yeah, sorry, I jumped ahead some there. No, that's yeah. okay. My question wasn't yeah. altogether clear. But there were tensions or contradictions in Reagan's vision, right? And you said that in his own view, there wasn't really much of a, or maybe he did acknowledge this contradiction, winning the Cold War, but doing it peacefully. Peace through strength, but also not rubbing the Soviet Union's nose in it and outreach mm -hmm. as well, combining those two, I guess, a two-pronged strategy. But that sent mixed signals to the Soviet Union. From the outside, it looked like Reagan could potentially be dangerous. That was what his domestic critics said. That's what his European critics said. And that's how mm -hmm. it looked inside the Kremlin. Yeah, yeah. And this is where, well, in hindsight, we can see, I think, some pretty clear contours of this strategy and these principles. Implementing them was difficult, was messy, and was quite dangerous at times. And so, yeah, especially in Reagan's first term, the, the Kremlin leadership was pretty terrified of him, certainly felt very threatened by him because he's using very bellicose rhetoric. He's evil saying empire. That evil empire. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. It's going to end up on the ash heap of history. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. You know, no American president had ever talked about the Kremlin this this way before. And this is being accompanied by very significant defense buildup, the deployment of our intermediate range nuclear missiles in Europe, the Pershing yeah. twos and the ground launch cruise missiles, massive protests against Reagan's nuclear deployments as well. And so it's a very dangerous time in the Cold War, you know, especially in the fall of 1983. I think that's the most dangerous moment since the Cuban Missile Crisis over, over two decades earlier. Because it looks like he is making nuclear war more possible when really Reagan all along, and this is something that his critics did get wrong, hated nuclear weapons. But his idea of disarmament was, well, first we have to build up and then we can convince the Soviets to disarm together, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, Reagan... Well, that's a, that's like, tricky to do that. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is very tricky. It sounds nice on paper, but try doing this in practice, right? But I'm glad you picked that up because Reagan was a lifelong committed nuclear abolitionist. He hated nuclear weapons. He was terrified of them. And once in office, that was one of his main goals is eliminating all nuclear weapons. But he believed that the biggest threat to nuclear war wasn't just the weapons themselves, but them in the hands of the Soviet system, Soviet communism, which he saw as truly, truly malevolent. And so it was a war of ideas. His, it was a war of yeah, ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I you know, make that clear in the book that he saw the Cold War primarily as a battle of ideas, which also happened to be a great power contest. Most previous Cold War presidents had seen it primarily as a superpower contest that happened to have an ideological dimension. And so you know, that's why, especially in the first term, Reagan presses that battle of ideas, you know, with his speeches, with his support for religious and political dissidents inside the Soviet Union, which drives the Soviets nuts, with his increasing support for Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, on every front possible, he is trying to 
delegitimize Soviet communism, show its wickedness, its inefficiencies, its oppression, and also, you know, offer the positive alternative of the free world, if you will, of democracy, of open markets, of, of free societies. And reach out at the same time. I mean, he did reach out to Brezhnev. Yeah. Brezhnev wanted no part of it. And yeah. I don't believe Andropov or Chernenko wanted it either. So 1982, I believe, NSDD 32, National Security Directive 32, you cite pipe summary of what that entailed. Communism is inherently expansionist. Its expansionism will subside only when the system either collapses or at the very least is thoroughly reformed. The Stalinist model on which Soviet communism, the linchpin of worldwide communism, is based confronts at present a profound crisis caused by persistent economic failures and difficulties brought about by expansion. On and on it goes. I mean, this was U.S. policy, but there was an important change in 1983, right? And in that 1983 policy, Archie Brown makes this argument. The Reagan administration decided its goal was not to dismantle the Soviet state or break up the Soviet state. Why did the policy begin to soften, if that's the right word? Yeah, this is where I disagree with Archie. Okay. I, I just I just don't think it did. You know, sure, there will be some tactical adjustments that we can point to, but I think the record's pretty clear. And I, you know, try to lay out abundant specific evidence and examples of this in the book that all along Reagan did want to see the dismantling of the Soviet Union and the end of Soviet communism. But he just wanted to do it peacefully while also reducing nuclear weapons and you know having a peaceful outcome. Once Gorbachev comes along and he has, of course, a partner for peace, he will he will soften some of this. But remember, Remember, you know, even with the many crises of, of the fall of 1983, you know, the shoot down of Korean Airlines 007, a couple terrifyingly close nuclear scares, Reagan maintains the INF deployment. He maintains his ideological offensive against Soviet communism. He keeps saying very explicitly that he's hoping that his defense buildup will put such pressure on the Soviet economy that it just collapses. And you look at all the things he's calling on the Soviets to do, to end their sponsorship of communist proxy forces in the third world, to relinquish their control of the Warsaw Pact, to allow political and religious freedom, to reduce their nuclear arsenals. If you have all that, you're not going to have a Soviet Union anymore. You're not going to have a Soviet system anymore. So that's why I think if you look at his policies, he's, he's pretty consistent on that. That's interesting. He wanted them to get out of Afghanistan as well. Yes. Yeah. So Reagan wanted the Cold War to end peacefully. He and Gorbachev accomplished that together. I do give Gorbachev more credit, but that's okay. No one, no one's listening to the podcast here, what I have to say about these things. However, he was willing to use or back violent, in many cases, right-wing authoritarian movements or insurgencies in places like Central America and tiny, powerless, inconsequential countries in order to roll back communism. What are your thoughts on that contradiction and why the United States got itself involved in these places? I'm thinking Iran-Contra and other places like that. I want to come back to Iran-Contra because, as you know, I spent a lot of time on that in the book, and it's a very sordid, complicated episode. But let's talk first there about the bigger picture, which is the Reagan doctrine of supporting anti-communist forces in developing countries. And I overall have a more favorable assessment of that in the book, although I still try to be very clear about some of its terribly costly downsides. But first, a couple of big picture principles. This is where Reagan is very much shaped by two previous episodes in history, World War II and Vietnam. Vietnam. And his takeaways from World War II are the importance of allies and a strong united front in fighting against totalitarianism, but also the sad, tragic need for moral compromises. And of course, what is a key feature of American policy in World War II is providing billions of dollars in economic assistance and military aid to one of the most vicious, wicked regimes on, in human history, and that is Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. Why were we doing that? And you know, the moral taint of propping up Stalin, of keeping him and his regime alive, because we are fighting the greater evil of, of Nazism. Oh, the Red um, Army and, was destroying the Wehrmacht, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we needed to do to defeat the utter wickedness of Hitler and Nazi Germany. So Reagan, he saw Soviet communism as evil as Nazi as Nazi Germany. And when you look at communism's death toll, you know, over the 20th century, causing the deaths of somewhere between 65 and 100 million innocent civilians, I think it's a pretty wicked, wicked system. Yeah, but El Salvador, Nicaragua, I mean, these are tiny countries. 
Yeah, well, no, and here's the the second point to come to on how he's shaped by Vietnam. Reagan is very desperate to keep American ground forces out of combat in peripheral conflicts. That's one of his takeaways. That's why he's very restrained about the use of force. But when you look at more recent history from his vantage point, when you see the communist revolution in Nicaragua in 1979, when you see Soviet support for the Sandinista regime, when you see Cuban support for the Sandinistas, including for supporting communist forces in these other countries, such as El, El Salvador, Reagan, he faces a tough choice. Do you allow these countries to go full communist? He doesn't want to do that. I share that assessment. Do you want to send in American ground forces for another Vietnam? Absolutely not. He doesn't even consider that. And so what are what are the least bad of a bad set of options? Well, it's supporting the anti-communist forces. But here's another point where I, I give Reagan a partial pass, at least. In his first couple of years in office, he is rather indifferent to the abuses that the, some of these right-wing military governments are inflicting on their own people in the name of anti-communism. But by 1982, he becomes more morally convicted, if you will, on that, and also realizes this is just not good for the United States to be supporting some of these, these thug regimes. And so he and George Shultz together start a pretty clear policy of pressuring and supporting our right-wing authoritarian allies to democratize, to respect more human rights. Now, they want to do that without letting them also go communist, which is even worse for human rights. It's a very delicate balance. It's a very messy process. But when you look at the, the results of this by 1988, you have peaceful democratic transitions in South Korea, which had previously been a brutal right-wing dictatorship, in Taiwan, in the Philippines, in El Salvador, in Chile, when Reagan helps usher Pinochet out of power, in Argentina, in Brazil, I could mention others. And so I think when you look at the end goals that he was that he was working for, of keeping those places from falling to communism, while also encouraging more support for human rights and democracy and these peaceful transitions, on the whole, given the bad choices, I think it's a pretty good record. Well, it's mm -hmm. my view that the Cold War could have ended as it did without the Iran-Contra scandal. And then that was one of the more shameful episodes in recent American history that is somewhat forgotten these days. Yeah, Iran-Contra is certainly one of Reagan's low points. And it's a result uh, in part of his poor attention to management. It's a result in part of a little bit of an ends justifies the means mentality. It's partly driven by his humanitarian concern of the plight of the hostages and a little bit of a diluted hope that just as Nixon could do a strategic opening to China, turn a former enemy into a friend, maybe the United States could do that with, with Iran as well. My purpose was to convince Tehran that our negotiators were acting with my authority to send a signal that the United States was prepared to replace the animosity between us with a new relationship. So I'm a little more critical, well, very critical of him on the arms for hostages with Iran. The diversion of the funds to the Contras, I'm less critical of Reagan personally because I don't think he knew about it. Where he bears responsibility, however, is he should have known about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not a good, well-managed White House <laughs> if you don't, you know. You know yeah, Ali uh, North he, was running a CIA within the CIA. I mean, these were criminal activities yeah, that Reagan yeah. was unaware of. I believe it is inevitable that the Congress will, in the end, blame the executive branch. But I suggest to you that it is the Congress which must accept at least some of the blame in the Nicaraguan freedom fighters matter. Plain and simple, the Congress is to blame because of the fickle, vacillating, unpredictable, on-again, off-again policy toward the Nicaraguan democratic resistance. My fellow Americans, I've thought long and often about how to explain to you what I intended to accomplish. But I respect you too much to make excuses. The fact of the matter is that there's nothing I can say that will make the situation right. Being unaware does not absolve you of, of responsibility. I tried to explain Iran-Contra, but I certainly do not try to excuse it. So we have finally arrived in 1985, and I'll make a couple of observations that you can respond to as the Politburo elevates Gorbachev to the position of general secretary. This is the shortest succession process in Soviet history. They really didn't have many options left. The three previous premiers died in the course of a couple of years, Brezhnev in 82, then Andropov, then Chernenko. So number one, I have seen no evidence, and of course I'm not an expert on this, I have not read everything that's out there, but I have seen no evidence that the Politburo's decision was in any way influenced by what was going on in the United States, U.S. policy or Reagan. That's number one. And number two, to this point in Reagan's presidency, his rhetoric and policy, including the arms buildup, 
had produced the opposite of the desired effect in the Soviet Union. And this is according to Archie Brown, who we mentioned before. He is a foremost expert on Gorbachev's time in power. He pokes holes in the notion that there was a meaningful change in Soviet defense policy. So why don't you take on those two points? Yeah. So a couple disclaimers, Martin, because this is obviously a very important episode and very complicated one. The first is I'm not a Sovietologist. I'm not a Russian speaker. And so I will not pretend to you know, be the final authority on the ins and outs of Kremlinology at, at this time. Well, you know, what I know I got from working off the work of other good Sovietologists, including Archie Brown and Bill Taubman, among among others, as well as a number of declassified translated Russian documents. But the second point is even the very best of our Russia and Soviet scholars will admit there's a lot that we don't know about what was going on within the Kremlin, the Soviet Union at the time, partly because there's a lot the Kremlin didn't know about itself. So, for example, economic figures, even how much they were spending on, on defense. Gorbachev himself couldn't find out what the real GDP figures were, what the real defense spending figures were, because the entire system was built on you know lies and distortions and, and quite a bit of corruption that had seeped in. And so there's quite a bit of speculation on any n- number of those fronts, whether you want to make the case for the Soviet economy on the verge of collapse, or whether you want to make the case for the Soviet economy, even though it was inefficient and rather moribund, still had a lot more resilience and, and depth to it. And we see this in CIA analyses at the time. I talked at length with Bob Gates about this in the course of research in the book. I read a lot of those declassified CIA analyses, and CIA itself was quite split internally. And sometimes their analyses are saying, hey, we see you know resilience and durability in the Soviet economy, and they're going to continue growing at 1% to 2% and limping along. Others saying, oh, it's really bad, and they're, they're facing, facing a real crisis. There's just, there's just a lot of un- unknown there. And then finally, there still is quite a bit unknown on uh, how and why exactly Gorbachev came to power. With all those disclaimers, I'll lay out the situation as, as I see it. First, I don't make the case in the book that the Politburo was trying to respond directly to Reagan or bring out a counterpart to Reagan or something like that with Gorbachev. I think that would be too neat and tidy. Rather, I do think the available evidence we do have shows that the Kremlin was feeling considerable pressure about their overextended commitments, supporting all the communist proxy movements in the developing world. You know, they're subsidizing Cuba at one to two billion U.S. dollars equivalent a year. The next year, they give a billion dollars to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So they're feeling overextended those commitments. They're feeling overextended from their commitments of their troop deployments and subsidies for the Warsaw Pact, right? That's incredibly expensive for them. It's politically costly, but it's also economically expensive. Yeah, Afghanistan this, too. The cost of Afghanistan, the body bags in Afghanistan, and then the cost of their own their own defense budget. So they're feeling all that. They know that they're, you know, in the last three years, the three previous rulers have have died. I do think there's a plausible counterfactual that they maybe could have gone with Andrei Gromyko instead of Gorbachev. Gromyko doesn't seem like he wanted, but if they wanted to continue with another old line, old style hardliner, Gromyko was there, you know, the, the foreign minister. Instead, he throws his support to Gorbachev. I don't think it's likely they would have necessarily picked Gromyko, but I only put that out there. It's not that there were no possible alternatives. And going back to all that pressure that the Soviet system is feeling from its internal rot and its inefficiencies and its overextension, at least some of that pressure in turn is a direct result. I think, of American policies. And this is where I will point to some causality. It's not that the United States engineers the selection of Gorbachev. The United States contributes to the conditions the Soviets are feeling that lead to the selection of Gorbachev. Uh, You know, if we run the counterfactual, let's say that, uh, you know, Carter instead had had a second term and pursued a a policy of milder pressure on the Soviets. You know, he was starting to get a little harder dosed in his last two years in office, but a milder one, you know, without the aggressive defense buildup of Reagan, without the Reagan doctrine, without all the other instruments that are putting pressure on the Kremlin. I don't know that the Kremlin would have accelerated its move towards Gorbachev as quick as it did or been feeling as as much pressure. I don't think you can understand the selection of Gorbachev without at least some of the the American pressure. As we discussed earlier in the program, Part of Reagan's strategy from 81 had been pressuring the system to produce a reformer, to strengthen reformers' voices, to produce a reformist leader. Doesn't mean he gets all the credit for Gorbachev coming to power, but there was certainly some intentionality to Reagan's strategy. Well, as you have explained, Reagan had a two-track approach, if you will, outreach combined with a more Mm -hmm. confrontational policy. The Soviets Mm -hmm. only seemed to react to the more confrontational side of, of Reagan's first term. Even though, you know, he never was able to 
you know, do a summit with Brezhnev or Andropov or, or Chenyenko. Looking back, we can see a couple early shoots of at least some mild response to Reagan's outreach. So, for example, in February of 83, when Reagan meets with uh, Soviet ambassador Dobrynin and they cut the quiet deal to get the Siberian Pentecostals released, it may seem like a smallish human rights humanitarian case, but that's Reagan's first time as president meeting with any Soviet official and do, anytime doing any negotiation, and they get the outcome they want. The Soviets release the Siberian Pentecostals, and Reagan keeps his commitment to the Kremlin that he'll never say a word publicly about it. He won't humiliate them. Then, of course, in I think it was the fall of 1984, Gromyko is coming over to New York for the UN General Assembly. Reagan invites him down to the White House. They have a good meeting. Reagan says, listen, I'm ready to negotiate. Uh, I think the time is right for our, our two countries to have a more sustained high-level dialogue. Gromyko takes that back to the Kremlin as well. So there hadn't been a lot of response from the Kremlin, but there'd been, there'd been bits and pieces. And these, of course, had whetted Reagan's appetite for more negotiations, for more outreach. So when Gorby does come to power, you are right, and I think most scholars agree on this point, he clearly believes that the Soviet Union is spending too much money on defense, and it is compromising uh, living standards and, I guess, the consumer side of their economy, which was always a basket case, and he does want to do something about that. So there's a lot of lingering distrust on both sides, right? Uh, This was a cold period in the Cold War, but the two men do hit it off. So let's talk about their first meeting. November of 85, so Gorbachev is only in power for a few months, in Geneva. Why were they able to establish such a strong rapport? And what was the significance of that first summit? Yeah, it's a really remarkable summit because the eyes of the entire world are on Geneva at the time, right? Thousands of uh, international media descend on the city. You know, there's incredible stagecraft there. It's picked because it is a neutral city in a neutral country, you know, in the heart of Europe, which is the geopolitical heart of the, heart of the Cold War. So there's ample symbolism. And Reagan and Gorbachev both really hit it off personally from the start. You know, Reagan is you know, relational president. He prides himself on his negotiating skills, going back to his time as a Hollywood labor negotiator. Uh, he's fascinated by the human dimension or, you know, the human factor, as Archie Brown's book puts it. And Gorbachev, likewise, is this very charismatic figure who also looks to make human connections. And so, you know, when they first meet, they go for a walk, they sit in front of the fire. It's just the two of them and their, and their interpreters, you know, not the rest of the cast cabinet entourage. And they spend time just getting to know each other personally. They realize that they both come from humble backgrounds and rural parts of their country, and they both you know, rose up to the pinnacle of power. They both have visions, partly shared, partly differing for transforming the Cold War and transforming the relationship between their countries. And they're looking to forge the, the beginnings of, of trust. And so on, on that level, it's a really remarkable summit and a really remarkable moment in 20th century history. And what was accomplished of substance? Because the INF Treaty, which I believe was the first major arms reduction treaty signed by the two sides. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That comes along in 87. So Mm -hmm. do they make progress on the INF treaty here in 85? Uh, so, no, here's the thing with Geneva is it's a successful summit in the fact that they build a relationship and build trust, but there's almost nothing of substance accomplished, right? There's no new treaties coming out of it. There's mild agreements to maybe exchange student exchanges or cultural exchanges, a few token things like that, but really nothing of a major substance in terms of policy agreements. But neither of them had expected a lot of that going in. You know, some of this is about managing expectations because this was, you know, the first time for Reagan to even be meeting with a so head of state. Yeah, he break just the ice. To, like said, build, <laughs> yeah, break the ice. Exactly. And even though I talk about the trust that they built, you know, if you read the transcripts, they also have some fierce exchanges, right? I mean, they both lose their tempers a few times. You know, angry words are exchanged. Gorbachev is suspicious and mad about SDI. Gorbachev feels irked at Reagan's pressure on human rights. That was something that was especially nettlesome to, to Gorbachev and he, and he took personally. Gorbachev makes all sorts of accusations about human rights violations in the United States. But then in the closing press conference, you know, they're smiling. Reagan leans over to Gorbachev and says something like, well, your hardliners and my hardliners aren't going to be happy about what's going on here with us. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but to hell with the past. Let's build a better future. And Gorbachev says, absolutely right. That's the significance of the summit is it lays the groundwork for what's to come later. I'm glad you brought up SDI because I want to talk mm-hmm. about that and the Iceland summit in 86. Mm-hmm. But first, a point about their rapport and how they were able to see eye to eye eventually on some issues. Both men abhorred nuclear weapons. We already referenced Mm -hmm. earlier in the interview how 
Reagan wanted peace. His critics thought that he was crazy. A cowboy wanted to press his finger on the button, but he wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. He was an abolitionist because there was this idea that the nuclear balance of terror was something that should be maintained as a way of preventing war. Reagan's worldview was influenced also by this movie, The Day After in 1983, which horrified him. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? And what (laughs) underpinned MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, the idea that both sides would destroy each other and human existence, or as they said in Dr. Strangelove, all plant and animal life on Earth, was this idea, and I'm going to get to my point here, was the idea that neither side could defend itself against nuclear attack. Thus, the importance of first strike capability, second strike. So Reagan, he doesn't want to surrender to this notion, and he embraces SDI, called derisively Star Wars, Strategic Defense Initiative. So how does this, before we get to Iceland in 86, how does this initiative, SDI, because it comes about well before even Geneva, Mm -hmm. how does it affect relations with the Soviets, especially going into that second summit? Yeah, SDI becomes probably the single biggest sticking point or point of contention or neuralgic point in the U.S.-Soviet relationship and in Reagan and Gorbachev's relationship personally. And that alone should tell us just how significant it is. And you laid out the background very well, right? So at this point, for about 35 years in the Cold War, there had been this nuclear standoff between these two superpowers, and they hadn't gone to full-on hot war against each other yet partly because of this balance of terror, of the threat of mutual assured destruction. Reagan felt strongly as a matter of principle and of of prudence that is nothing to continue relying on, because at the heart of it is this really perverse notion that our security rests on our willingness to incinerate, massacre millions of Russian civilians, and in turn, their security rests on their willingness to to do that to us. And he's found that so perverse, let alone just the possibility of miscalculation, misperception, accidental launch. We can do a whole other show on all the close calls and might have been of nuclear warnings in in, in the Cold War. So Reagan just wants to get beyond that, as does Gorbachev. So Reagan's vision for that is, well, let's build this ballistic missile shield. You know, he's pitched it by some brilliant, although, you know, somewhat eccentric scientists, such as Edward Teller. Some of the Joint Chiefs are excited about it as well. And so he announces that initiative in March of 1983. You know, it's immediately derided by a lot of expert opinion. Most scientists oppose it because they don't think it's, it will work. It's just not technically feasible. Most arms control experts oppose it because they do think it will work in terms <laughs> of they worry that if this actually becomes operational, it'll upset the mutual assured destruction. It'll it'll upset that precarious strategic balance. Gorbachev is terrified that it'll work because he's fascinated by and very impressed by American technology. Reagan himself hopes it would eventually work, but you can find a number of quotes from Reagan saying, look, if this ever does become operational, it'll be years from now, but we at least want to give it a try and we're not going to, we're not going to trade it away. Well, in retrospect, it was a mistake. And in the end, it was a delusion all along. It never, never comes to anything despite all the money that was spent on it. You know, Reagan did have this very important pragmatic side, but it seems he let himself get carried away with SDI to the point where in 1986 in Reykjavik, it gets in the way of what would have been the most amazing breakthrough in arms control history, right? The Soviet Union insisted that we sign an agreement that would deny to me and to future presidents for 10 years the right to develop, test, and deploy a defense against nuclear missiles for the people of the free world. You know, the Reykjavik summit, October of 1986, along with Geneva, one of the most dramatic moments in 20s, not just Cold War history, I think 20th century history, modern human history, where it, the summit's put together in fairly short notice. Gorbachev had reached out and said, hey, let's let's meet again. It initially wasn't even supposed to be a full on summit, but rather kind of a pre summit, just the two sides talking over a weekend about what they might do next. But both of them, you know, over the course of their, you know, very intense uh, two days and, you know, long hours and late nights of negotiations, start trying to, in some ways, outdo each each other in more and more ambitious proposals to first, you know, let's slash our nuclear arsenals in half by each. Okay, well, let's take it even further. Let's let's look at abolishing all of our nuclear arsenals. First, let's abolish all of our nuclear missiles. Then let's just all abolish all of our warheads together, including gravity bombs and other warheads. Go for broke, and, basically. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And again, reading the transcripts of those meetings is, is really remarkable. But it falls apart, as you said, 
over the question of SDI, and even more pointedly over just one word, laboratory. So Gorbachev, who again is obsessed with SDI and wants to do everything he can to persuade Reagan to drop it, says, I will only eliminate all of our nuclear weapons and agree to the United States doing the same if you will confine your SDI research to the laboratory. Doing it on computer screens on so forth. You can't go out and do real testing of it if you get any of these missile defenses operational. And Reagan doesn't want to give that up. He doesn't know if the system will actually work, but he thinks the only way we can find out if it'll work is if we can do real robust testing. And so he says, I don't want to just confine it to the laboratory. You know, we can continue to debate which leader was perhaps bears more responsibility here. Was was Reagan being too stubborn to insist on the theoretical right to be able to do operational testing? Was Gorbachev being too stubborn and paranoid to insist that the testing be confined to the laboratory? You know, why, why is he so worried about this if they're going to eliminate nuclear weapons anyway? Reagan does make the point a few times saying, look, a big part of this, of course, is eliminating the threat of nuclear war between the U.S. and Soviet Union. But what if a madman like Qaddafi gets a nuclear weapon after our sides have, have limited them? He says, I want our country to be able to defend itself against rogue states, you know, latter day Iran's and North Korea's that we're worried about now. And similarly, Reagan keeps telling Gorbachev, look, if we can get this thing operational, we'll share the technology with you. We don't want to use it for a first strike capability. We don't want it to use it as an excuse for the United States to be able to attack the Soviets because we could then defend ourselves against your retaliation. But even though so much trust had been built up between the two leaders, there wasn't enough trust to get them over that last hump of abolishing all nukes and, and coming to terms with SDI. Your book is an amazing catalog of all of these meetings. And of course, now we have the declassified documents. Something that I was struck by was all of the minutia that was involved in arms negotiations. In other words, these were hard deals to strike. And then here we are in Iceland in 86 with both leaders saying, you know what, let's just get rid of them all. It just seems crazy reading these passages in your book to think that both sides have so many missiles that they can destroy the earth many times over. But then they're grappling with each other about, well, you have 75 SS-20 missiles, which was a Soviet missile in Eastern Europe. And we think we should only have, well, 75 of this kind, and they're quibbling over fractions. So, I mean, that wasn't really a question, but maybe you can just address the fact that I guess we've lost sight of, well, a couple things. We're no longer afraid of nuclear war the way we used to be, although maybe that fear is coming back a little bit because of Putin. And we've also lost these important treaties. So, mm -hmm. you know, take that wherever you'd like. Yeah, exactly. And this is a good pivot. So even though Reykjavik appears at the time to be a catastrophic failure and there's, you know, very gloomy and dismal headlines coming out of it. And, you know, the photos, if you see the photos of Reagan and Gorbachev leaving Hofti House, the, the Icelandic house where they'd been negotiating, they both just look terrible, very grim, very despondent, knowing they'd come so close, but it couldn't, they couldn't finalize it. And yet we can now, I think, look back and see what Reykjavik did show both sides is they are willing to do really bold, revolutionary, ambitious arms control proposals. And a few months after Reykjavik, Reagan, of course, immediately after the summit gets very distracted by the Iran-Contra scandal and some terrible mistakes he and his administration making that. But a few months later, he's kind of coming out of the scandal. And then Gorbachev reaches back out via Schultz and says, hey, we're ready to do a deal on the intermediate range nuclear missiles. And these were in some ways the most terrifying destabilizing missiles of the Cold War because the SS-20s on the Soviet side were mobile, so harder to detect. They were solid fueled, so they could be launched immediately. You know, you didn't have to take time to fuel them with liquid fuel, which spy satellites could detect. And they were about eight to 10 minutes flight time from most European capitals, as well as they were deployed in the Soviet Far East and were just a few minutes flight yeah. time from Seoul and Tokyo. And they had multiple and warheads, right? Yeah, and they, they were MIRVed, yeah, so you know, so they had three, three warheads MIRVed. each, right? So <laughs> arcane arms control technology, I'm doing it again. Um, and meanwhile, the United States had deployed our Pershing-2 missiles and then our ground-launched nuclear-tipped cruise missiles as well. And so Europe is five minutes away from nuclear destruction yes. on, on either side. And Reagan's proposal had been, let's go to zero, zero, where we will eliminate, not just reduce or remove, we will eliminate all of our intermediate-range nuclear missiles if you, the Soviets, do, do likewise. And Gorbachev Gorbachev had initially balked at that, as had previous Kremlin rulers. But then Gorbachev decides, no, we need to do this. And this is where Reagan's force and diplomacy come together, because Gorbachev said several times, those Pershing twos are like a pistol cocked at our head, because they were only eight-minute flight time from Moscow. It's terrifying. 
you know, this culminates in December of 1987 when Reagan and Gorbachev signed the INF Treaty, first and thus far only treaty in history that eliminates an entire class of nuclear weapons, doesn't just reduce them or control their growth or anything like that. So it's really revolutionary. And Reagan takes a lot of heat for this from his right flank. You know, a number of very conservative Republican senators like Jesse Helms and Dan Quayle, Malcolm Wallop are really opposed to it. And then, you know, kind of old gray beards like Richard Nixon and Brent Scowcroft and Henry Kissinger. Are, are also opposed to it. And some of Reagan's own staff are a little worried about it. Some of the allies are worried about it. But Reagan and Gorbachev, this is where they partner together to go beyond their own political bases and, and really transform the Cold War. But we've lost all of these treaties except for a new start. I'll just uh, cite a few lines from a piece that Mary Elise Sarati wrote in the New York Times a few months ago. Uh, she said, the new START treaty is now the only restraint on the number and types of U.S. and Russian nuclear weapons. It expires in 2026 and there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope of renewal. She writes, the ABM treaty is gone. Uh, the conventional armed forces in Europe treaty is gone. The INF treaty that we were just discussing, abrogated by the Trump administration in 2019 over claims that the Russians had violated it. So what are your thoughts? And we'll return to Reagan and Gorbachev in a moment, but uh, we'll stay on this tangent because it's, it's relevant to what we're discussing while we're talking about Reagan's legacy here. We have lost these critical non-proliferation or disarmament pacts. Yeah, you're right, Martin. It's a very different era. But but here's where I and, and Mary's a longtime friend of mine. And I think the world of her scholarship, we go back to grad school days together. But here's where I will say two things, which may seem paradoxical, but you know, give me a second. I think you'll at least see the difference I'm trying to make. I think that when the Reagan administration and you know Nixon and Carter before that concluded those treaties, especially the Reagan ones, those were landmark. They were very positive. They are incredible legacy items, and they were essential for bringing the Cold War to a peaceful end. And so I think the critics of those treaties in the day were wrong, and Reagan and Gorbachev were right, full stop, and they made the world a safer place. But for Reagan, the arms control treaties, they were still a means to a bigger end of reducing the threat of Soviet communism itself, and eventually he hoped to even see the, the defeat of that system. And we're in a very different geopolitical context now. Uh, and so remember, Reagan's strategy had been first build up American forces, right? He wouldn't have gotten the INF Treaty if he didn't first deploy the Pershing twos and, and the, the ground launch cruise missiles. And so now, you know, we have a different set of concerns, especially the People's Liberation Army, Communist China's massive intermediate range conventional and nuclear missile force. And so that's why I will say, even though I was not a fan of the Trump administration overall and did not vote for him and did, did not support him, I do think the decision to withdraw from the INF treaty was the right one because we need those a new generation of those weapons to counter China. And hopefully we can take a page out of the Reagan playbook and deploy those a new generation of those missiles against China and bring China back to the negotiating table and eventually get them eliminated again. So it's kind of like we're back in, back in that cycle. Yeah, I guess my point is we need more Reagans and Gorbachevs in the world now. We don't. We're going in the opposite direction of the vision they laid out for the world. And, well, I think we need... Maybe I sound naive like a hippie. Fewer nuclear weapons yeah. than, than more. So we'll get to the main order of business in a bit, who ended communism. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to 1988. So mm -hmm. Reagan is now at Moscow State University giving a stirring speech under a statue of Lenin. He's walking mm -hmm. through Red Square with Gorbachev. Uh, where he's asked whether he still believes the Soviet Union was an evil empire. And Reagan says no. Just seeing two leaders who had been divided by this chasm or their countries had been divided by this chasm for so long, walking together in Red Square. When I had Archie Brown on the podcast, I told him about how when I was a kid, we had these huge maps of the world adorning the classroom walls. And the Soviet mm -hmm. Union was so big and imposing. And then you had communist yeah. China and the eastern satellites. It was like this was never going to go away and the two sides would be at odds with each other forever. And here you have Gorbachev and Reagan enjoying a laugh, casually walking through Red Square, talking to regular people, talking to reporters. Do you still think yes, you're in an evil empire, Mr. President? No. I hate the term optics in modern mm -hmm. political discourse, but I mean, those optics were important. I mean, you need to have that too. Politics is not just about policy and behind closed door negotiations. 
Oh, you're exactly right. And those optics were indicative of a much deeper substance, a much deeper transformation in the relationship. And it sent great signals to the American people about, hey, we're, we're moving from hostility towards friendship with this uh, this country, sent great signals to the, the Soviet people about the reforms that were underfoot in their society as well. And the mere fact of Gorbachev allowing Reagan to give a speech at Moscow State University, uncensored, broadcast, you know, live and, and translated throughout the country. I can tell you that Nothing would please my heart more than in my lifetime to see American and Soviet diplomats grappling with the problem of trade disputes between America and a growing, exuberant, exporting Soviet Union that had opened up to economic freedom and growth. Remarkable. I don't think that there ever before had been an American president in Cold War history allowed to give a speech in Moscow broadcast nationwide un Amazing. uncensored like that. So it's amazing. So it brings me to the main order of business about who ended communism. In my view, it, Gorbachev was the key player. The Pope, mm -hmm. Reagan, and others played important roles. But without Gorbachev, none of this happens. Communism collapses from within. To be clear, I will not pick one single person who is the monocausal or one single factor that's the monocausal driving force behind all this. I mean, it's it's all the people you mentioned. Without Gorbachev, it doesn't happen. So full stop. So he's indispensable. I just would also say and try to make the case in my book that without Reagan, it doesn't happen either. How can we you know parse out the precise levels of causality? Is it 50-50? Is it 60-40? You know, it's almost impossible to know. I do lean a little more towards giving Reagan a little more credit for that pressure uh, on the Soviet Soviet system that he started applying in his first term and for, you know, for his efforts to induce the system to produce a reformist leader and for the all out money front assault he wages on the legitimacy, the edifice of Soviet communism as as a system and yet doing it with that outreach as well. But but if Gorbachev had not had not come along, uh, yeah, we wouldn't have seen those changes either. And so that's why we have to talk about them as as partners for peace, even though, as you point out, at the end of the day, their fundamental goals diverge. Reagan wants a peaceful end of the Cold War that includes the demise of Soviet communism. Gorbachev wants a peaceful end of the Cold War that preserves Soviet communism. And I think one interesting observer I picked up, I just made a passing reference to this in my book, who in hindsight is rather prophetic is Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese leader at the time. And in either 85 or 86, he's meeting with George Shultz in Beijing. And Shultz asks Deng, you know, what do you think of this new Soviet leader? And Deng says, you know, he's going about it all wrong. He's trying to rush the political reforms through without doing enough of economic reform. And that's going to raise public demand and expectations among Soviet people that he can't deliver on. Instead, what he should do, says Deng, is do economic reform while maintaining tight grip on the Communist Party's monopoly on power, not do the political reforms. And, you know, that's a somewhat oversimplified, but if you want to understand why Soviet communism collapses and why here in the year 2022, the Chinese Communist Party is still the one party ruling China, I do think that Deng Xiaoping accurately yeah. predicted that. What was Reagan's, I mean, we didn't have Reagan's voice in the 1990s because of the Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. What was his vision for a post-Soviet Europe? You know, I'm, I'm just going to be speculating here again because he doesn't fully lay that out. It seems pretty clear he had really envisioned or hoped for a, a true friendship between the country of Russia and the country of the United States. You know, he had always had great affection for the Russian people and for Russian culture and, and society and history. But it's also very clear with his fierce advocacy for freedom and self-determination for the peoples of Central and Eastern Europe that he wanted them to be freed from Soviet control, freed from the threat of Russian domination. You know, he's very shaped by World War II and the aftermath there as well. So I suspect he would have probably been uh, in general in favor of something like NATO en enlargement, precisely because that was such a strong demand of the people in countries of Central and Eastern Eastern Europe. He probably would have hoped there would have been a way to negotiate that without it being such a point of contention with with the Russians. But yeah, NATO I'm, enlargement I'm just, I'm just speculating here. Yeah. yeah, I think the way the US and Europe went about NATO enlargement helped poison relations between the U.S. and Russia during the 1990s. But, you know, on the other hand, for all the talk of democracy being on the retreat in some parts of the world and autocracy being on the march, Europe, for the most part, after the Cold War now, 30 years after, is still mostly democratic, 
pluralistic continent committed to upholding human rights under the European Union. So maybe Reagan's hopes for a peaceful democratic world don't look so bleak after all, right? And same for yeah, Gorbachev. I mean, Gorbachev wanted this as well. Not for, you know, obviously Russia hasn't gone the way he wanted, but. Yeah, exactly. And notes, you know, the Central and Eastern European countries by and large have pretty healthy economies too, certainly compared to the alternatives. And I'll extend the Reagan legacy a little further. I mean, the transitions to peaceful democracies in East Asia and Latin America, so South Korea, Korea in 87, uh, Taiwan in 87 to 89, the Philippines in 86, Chile being freed from the Pinochet dictatorship, you know, Argentina, Brazil. A lot of these are driven by local internal forces, but they're all actively supported by the Reagan administration. And Reagan, in addition to wanting to you know, defeat Soviet communism. He wanted to promote market democracies. He wanted to promote the free world, if you will. He did not see that confined only to white Western European and North North American countries. So, Will, my final observation, uh, and yeah. thank you for being so generous with your time here. It's hard to tackle Reagan in one podcast, but <laughs> I don't. Reagan's mark on history is secure. His influence over his old party seems to have waned. I mean, some of that is to be expected. His presidency did end 30 years ago go and kind of his reason for being or Reaganism's reason for being the Cold War and the Soviet Union, they're gone. But I often wonder what Reagan would think of these past few years of U.S. foreign policy, Donald Trump praising dictators, uh, praising Putin, taking a more transactional approach to foreign policy. Yeah. So again, I would not presume to, to speak for President Reagan today, right? That would not be my place at all. But what I can say is look at the values and policy priorities that he had during his day that he spoke up very eloquently on, that he pushed for, including against you know, oftentimes opposition within his own party. So strong commitment to allies. He's the president, you know, probably the American president most committed to allies, most valued them. Strong commitment to human rights and democracy and to values in, in foreign policy. A strong commitment to open trade. You know, he's very opposed to protectionism. Strong commitment to the, the dignity of the office, to working across party lines where possible. Quite uh, supportive and open to immigration, to refugees, uh, to asylum cases. He believed in border security too. Those should not be mutually exclusive. But he saw that as a great strength of America. And a real hopeful and optimistic vision for, for the future, right? That's the key to understanding him is that that hope and optimism and desire to bring the, bring the country together. Those are the right principles to have. They're the right policies to follow. And I think they speak for themselves. And they were certainly uh, politically successful, too, when you look at his record. As someone who still identifies as a Republican, I would encourage my fellow Republicans to take a fresh look at that record. What we see here is a political structure that no longer corresponds to its economic base, a society where productive forces are hampered by political ones. The decay of the Soviet experiment should come as no surprise to us. Wherever the comparisons have been made between free and closed societies, West Germany and East Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia, Malaysia and Vietnam, it is the democratic countries that are prosperous and responsive to the needs of their people. And one of the simple but overwhelming facts of our time is this. Of all the millions of refugees we've seen in the modern world, their flight is always away from, not toward, the communist world. On the next episode of History As It Happens, we're going to talk about one-term presidents. Donald Trump was one. Could Joe Biden be the next? What does the election of 1912 have to do with our weird politics today? We're going to speak to Jeffrey Engel next when we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.